Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkshire, host, and our guest is Nargis Arami, an assistant professor of anthropology at Yale University. Professor Arami primarily works on the relationship between economy and religion and how it's played out in the rituals of everyday life. Her work is centered in the holy city of Goham in Iran. Professor Arami's work includes a historical and ethnographic study of carpet merchants, and she is currently researching the cultural production of authority and knowledge through publications of Islamic texts and their global circulation. Today we'll talk with her about her forthcoming book on the Persian rug bazaar. Welcome, Professor Arami. Thank you, Marilyn, for having me. Let's begin with an overview of your book. Tell okay. us about it. Uh, well, my, uh, my book comes out of my dissertation primarily, um, where I spend um, two years, uh, two continuous years doing field work in the holy city of Qom and working primarily with carpet merchants, um, carpet producers, and the entire carpet community in the holy city of Qom. And I concentrate on the relationship between the bazaar, the market the, as, as it is known in Persian, and um, the merchants, um, the community in its own, so um, women, men, and all that who are involved in the community, mm -hmm. um, and um, the way um, carpets as a local yet global commodity um, interplay in everyday life. And I look at um, carpets as, um, as an art, as, as well as a sort of art and as a commodity form and um, commodity as an art form. So I look at the way that um, the designs of the carpets affect everyday life and how everyday life affects the designs of carpets. How did you become, um, how did you come to write the book? Well, I was born in the holy city of Qom okay. and to, to um, a carpet merchant family. So uh, why I became interested in, in writing about the book um, was that when I was an undergraduate, I started to read about um, Iranian history. And, um, and one of the things that I would continuously read, especially this is, um, this is in the 1990s, and I would read about the Islamic revolution that happened in 78, 79. And um, I was still uh, young, but I was still living in Iran at that time. And so I would hear about, and uh, uh, reading about it as an undergraduate, I would hear about um, the, the fact that there was um, this natural, almost organic relationship between merchants known as bazaris, uh, from the people from the bazaar, and the clerics. And this sort of natural relationship um, uh, was taken to be a sort of a fact. And, uh, and uh, in terms of um, as a given between power, a uh, power of the state and the people, and this relationship brought together um, the Bazaris against the um, the Shah at the time. And so, coming from a merchant family, and um, and again uh, simultaneously, um, I would read about the holy city of Rome as this sort of opaque place, a mysterious place, highly exoticized, not just outside of Iran, uh, when I was growing up in California, amongst the diaspora, the Iranian, com the large Iranian community in Southern California, um, where um, I would feel um, uh, reticent to say I was born in Rome. And so um, I started to- But why, why would you be afraid to say that? Um, because at the time, um, the, you know, so this was in the 1990s. Um, I had uh, I had grown up in in Iran until I was about seven years old, and had moved to the United Arab Emirates, and I was living in Dubai, where I I, I would feel a hint of that living in Dubai, but it was really in the in the United States amongst the um, Iranian community, the diaspora community, that I would feel that there was this um, tension. Um, between what the Islamic Republic um, at the time and what it stood for and um, the Iranians who felt that they were pushed out of the country because I of the see. clerics in charge. And the holy city of Qom is um, Iran's arguably most religious city. It is known as a seminary city. So all the clerics who took power at one point have studied in Qom or know each other from Qom or hold offices in Qom or actually live in Qom. Um, and so Ayatollah Khomeini held a ha house there and he was under house arrest later on and had to leave the country in exile. Um, and he is the, he's uh, the founder of the Islamic revolution, considered the sort of the father of the Islamic revolution. And um, the, uh, the people 
in the city of Qom uh, were known to be active in making the revolution. I and they see. were, and it's, uh, the, the city is sort of known for the kindle that started the revolution. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I grew up being um, from my father's side, who uh, my father's from there, his family's from there, and they continue to live there. I grew up um, having a very different view of the holy city of Qom. Um, I, um, I thought of it as, as a, I had wonderful childhood memories of, of um, uh, going to the uh, mausoleum. There is a female saint, um, the sister of the eighth imam, who's buried there. It's a pilgrimage city since mm -hmm. the ninth century. So I grew up um, thinking of it as a wonderful space. And um, though I knew that, uh, I soon found out that it represented something very negative for most Iranians living, uh, living abroad, especially. And even Iranians, after I went to do research in Iran, even for many Iranians living in, um, in Tehran, um, especially that this was a, a place that was um, um, in some ways um, anti-women um, because mm -hmm. Uh, even though now it is obligatory for women to wear the hijab and be covered in in Iran um, under under the the, the law uh, in the city of Qom, even before the revolution, where this law did not exist, you had to wear the hijab. It was um, enforced by society. Um, it was enforced by the fact that it was a seminary city and it was a pilgrimage city. And so, out of respect, folks were uh, the women were um, wore the hijab, but also men would conform to to um, be a little more conservative in the way they dress and the way they act it. Okay. Let's talk about the methodology you used uh, to, to write the book. How did you do your research? Um, well, I had the um, advantage of being from a merchant family. And um, bazaaris um, tend to be, um, and this is uh, in some ways a stereotype, but a stereotype that worked in my favor. They tend to um, not want to let people know about their business. Um, so I would, uh, I had access to accounting books. That was one of the, the resources that I tapped into. Uh, so I would start with my own family and then I had uh, folks in my own family introduce me to other folks in the bazaar. And then I was, I had access to something that was not readily available if I went to, let's say, the bazaars, you know, the markets in other cities. So let's say if I would go to, uh, to, um, bazaars in Tehran, I would be able to go into someone's store and start to interview them. But I wasn't always able to um, get an invite into their families' homes. And in Qom, I was able to do that. And after spending a long time in the bazaar, and of course, um, people remembered me being there when I was a little girl. Mm -hmm. So it allowed uh, me to enter their lives quite easily, even though they were very much aware that I was doing research. And um, I discovered that there is this entity um, that was really created um, after the revolution for members of the bazaar to be able to deal with their problems. It's, it's called an etahadiyya, which is basically a guild-like um, mm -hmm. institution. And, um, and so there is an etahadiyya for almost every vocation in the bazaar in every city, but some of them are more important than others and they would have these meetings and sometimes I wasn't allowed to go into the meetings, but my tape recorder was. So my presence as a female, as an outsider, um, was not permitted by the t but the, my tape recorder was, so I was able to um, get a very good um, uh, ethnographic feel for what was going on mm -hmm. uh, from the bazaar and then into, um, into their family homes. How many families um, are in the bazaar? I mean, uh, how many merchants are there? And I assume they're all family run? They're all family run. Uh, it's very much so. Um, one of the reasons that carpets become important is that it has a historical um, uh, presence that's, um, it, it's, it's, well, let's put it this way, it's historically imbued with power and art and craftsmanship and nationalism. And um, at the same time, uh, uh, I, I mostly concentrate on carpet merchants. And as I was saying before, when I would read uh, Iranian uh, books on Iranian history, the, the, the relationship between power and, um, and state, uh, as seen in, in the form of the bazaars, and the relationship between these merchants and the clerics were, was sort of given. Um, obviously, merchants would give, uh, based on religious um, tithing, would give a certain amount of money to clerics, and there were, there were always these ties. Um, but from uh, from my perspective, I wanted to 
not see it as a given. I want to actually describe this relationship. Mm -hmm. So I realized that when uh, when historians would refer to bazaris, there were all sorts of levels of bazaris. There were the very wealthy bazaris. There were sort of um, medium level bazaris, and based on their vocation, they were they were. Um, they were located differently in the actual bazaar, which is, you know, the bazaars are, are kind of where we get our modern malls, um, the, the sort of covered walking places. Mm -hmm. And so um, where you were located in, in the bazaar, which is sort of how it is now, even where you're located in the mall really says uh, about the kind of consumer that comes in. And mm -hmm. so uh, it dictates the, the, your importance in some ways within the community. And bazaars are centrally located in towns in, in Iran. And, um, and so I became sort of fascinated with, um, with the way um, these merchants were able to, with carpet merchants. And I was very much interested in carpet producing merchants. So mm -hmm. as opposed to carpet sellers, who you see, let's say, all over the US, okay. I became very interested in carpet producers because um, they know rugs intimately. They are the tastemakers, they are the designers, and they, they work a little bit like film producers. They bring all these different actors together. But, uh, but this guild that I was referring to, um, all these different actors, so um, designers, weavers, um, they were all part of this guild and they've all made up the larger community. Mm -hmm. And so um, part of what I was doing was doing ethnographic field work, is just a sort of spending time in the bazaar with them um, and moving from place to place as they moved. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other level was studying the design and doing an ethnography of design of the actual carpets. So um, I would look at the carpets also as a kind of document, as mm -hmm. a kind of piece of movable history, and I would read the design and uh, the thought behind the carpets um, in terms of how it affected, of course, the, the, uh, the carpet merchants and the way, the processes that would go into selling it or selling it overseas, which okay. is what primarily most of the rugs that are made in, um, in the city of Qom um, maybe more than 90% of it are for export. Okay, and that brings me to a term you use, the colonization of taste. What do you mean by that? Uh, well, the colonization of taste is a term I use in, um, in the book in order to uh, basically uh, understand um, how the merchants felt throughout history um, in a way, the, the way carpets were portrayed and who their consumers were. So um, uh, carpets are introduced to the Western world uh, through the Dutch paintings of the 16th, the 15th, 16th, and 16th and 17th centuries, and um, they were a particular design. Okay. And so they, they um, later on, um, Germ uh, some German, but mostly French and English travelers uh, were fascinated by, by carpet merchants. And already by the 19th century, they thought that um, their originality had, had basically um, died in Iran and that the, the sort of the zenith, the height of wonderful carpets from material to uh, design to color really um, was in the 16th and 17th century. And what they were witnessing in the 19th century um, was already the end of the carpet um, uh, the, the quality of carpets and the designs. And so... Um, um, Why is that? Well, a part of the, it, there were multiple factors, of course. Uh, one of the reasons was that um, the carpet merchants were um, moving away from um, uh, sort of natural dyes and moving into chemical dyes in okay. order to come up with uh, more intricate colors. Mm -hmm. uh, other reasons were uh, the movement of, um, well, the, one was the material also. Uh, th there was a, um, there, this, the, the wool and the carpet that was used, the quality of the material had, uh, had decreased um, mm -hmm. greatly. Um, the, the secondary reason is that the, the design seemed more repetitive and there was, um, uh, there was a movement also um, to kind of control this. And again, as carpets 
still um, tend to be, they are the second largest export out of Iran after oil, and they are still the only industry that is completely cottage industry run by merchants mm -hmm. and their families. And they see the weavers as an extension of their families. And sometimes, uh, at different times, the state and then again, um, foreign powers were trying to control the carpet industry in, in different ways. And in the, in the early 20th century, you begin to see American companies moving into Iran, and um, they were interested in controlling the carpet industry mm -hmm. by controlling the quality of the colors, uh, the quality of the actual carpets and uh, how straight they were, the designs, and uh, coming up with uh, pushing, pushing the merchants not to um, force the weavers into coming up with designs that they thought were what Europeans wanted or what other folks wanted, uh, but really what um, classic designs were. So pushing them back to do 16th and 17th century designs as opposed to new designs or innovative designs that they were interested in doing. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so that's the sort of historical trait okay. for this colonization of taste. And how does your research differ from, from the other work that's out there? Well, um, I look at the relationship. I feel as if you can't just look at the carpets. There, there are works done on carpets, and mostly sort of in terms of aesthetics. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that it's important to look at the carpets um, as, as design, as a commodity, uh, as an art form, and then also look at its circulation, um, but also look at the merchants who produce it. So I look at production and consumption as opposed to one or the other. And I also look at the relationship between the merchants, the weavers, and the families, and, um, and carpets. And one of the, uh, uh, and so all those things haven't been done together. And the other element is that um, carpets are autochthonous to so to where they're from. So it's important to know that this carpet is woven in Isfahan, designed in Isfahan, let's say, or woven in Shiraz or designed in Shiraz. And carpets are kind of branded that way, even mm -hmm. by now by families who, 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 um, who produce these carpets. And um, Qom became an interesting site for multiple reasons, because it's a religious city, um, because it's an important city now in um, it has national but international significance. Things that happen there have national and international significance. But, um, but also because Qom's, um, Qom's uh, rug industry is uh, the youngest and most successful. Uh, so what I was able to do was able to do oral history. So uh, just also from my own father's family, I knew that they began in the 1930s, and I started to conduct oral histories and discovered that the rug industry began in, in sometime in the 1930s mm -hmm. with a number of um, young families who were forced to migrate to the city um, for various reasons, but um, which I, I go into the book. But uh, but they were the original founders of the rug industry in the city of Qom. And because it was a brand new industry, because there was no history of it, they were able to play with designs and do all sorts of things. But it also allowed me to do the kind of research um, that hadn't been done before because um, there aren't really any documents about rug merchants, uh, production as much um, in terms of um, really anywhere else in Iran. And because this was a brand new industry, I was able to still find folks who were able to tell me. And I started to do this research in 1996. Mm -hmm. And so I would go summers and inter interview folks who had just started, who remembered um, their, their fathers or grandfathers, and sometimes themselves, uh, as they had moved into the city to start the rug industry. Mm -hmm. And in doing the research for the book, what was the most surprising thing you found? Well, the most surprising uh, thing that I found uh, was that being from a merchant family didn't immediately give me the access that I thought. At the same time, it did. At the same time, it made things very difficult because often people thought I was trying to steal designs mm -hmm. from my own family. And so um, I, was, I was forced to uh, prove myself in some ways. Um, this, that was probably one of the most um, surprising things for me. Uh, this 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 push to prove myself and once I was able to prove myself I was able to have access to rug merchants their private lives that even my family did not know about mm -hmm. so um, 
it, it took a long time to gain trust, but I was able to do it in, in a way that I thought, well, it was already afforded to me because of my family. But, but in fact, because of my family, um, sometimes it was heavily guarded. And um, I was incredibly fascinated um, by the way rug merchants and, and their, their families were so welcoming into their lives and it would allow me to look through, I was interested in what they were reading, for example, um, any sort of documents they would have in their houses. Um, they, they were open to everything and so I got to have a glimpse into their lives and um, I was not as much surprised as I was pleasantly um, uh, in some ways rewarded by the fact that I knew from a uh, few family friends that um, that women were very much involved in every aspect of this production mm -hmm. sometimes behind the scene team behind the scenes sometimes very much in the, in, in the very forefront of it and I was able to see that upfront and and personal and um, and was able to write about it and mm -hmm. so that became uh, incredibly rewarding and gratifying to know mm -hmm. that it is an it, it is a very much community base and to be able to write about their everyday experiences was really really rewarding in that way. Mm -hmm. I am curious, uh, you have uh, mentioned a couple of times that families are um, hesitant to let people in to see um, primarily the designs they are doing for the right. rug. Now, <clears throat> if, um, because it, it, it's secret, when a rug comes out and others see the design, are there any, like, a copyright kinds of right. can no one else create that kind of a rug once one family has done it no they can and I think okay. part of the the problem well it's it's not necessarily a problem for the rest of the world but a problem for the Iranian carpet merchants who believe that um, carpets originated in in Iran especially the modern carpet industry uh, so they're constantly battling uh, global competition. Mm -hmm. And in, in order to have these copyright laws, you would have to have a powerful state that is respected in the global international community. And of course, uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran has had um, tense moments with many folks in the world. And so at the same time, even um, friends as well as foes um, have, uh, have sort of uh, uh, pushed the, the carpet industry in some ways to become independent, but if the, the, the tension lies where the merchants want to have an independence, independence in terms of the carpet uh, industry, while the state wants to control the carpet industry. Now, if, you, if they were to give power to the state, the state might be able to control the copyright issues, but again, copyright issues are incredibly difficult for, for anybody. So um, rug merchants know that when they commission a designer to come up with a design, they probably have at most a year or two, mm -hmm. unless the design gets stolen, and then they have to come up with new designs. And these are sort of high-end merchants, so these are more like um, sort of luxury uh, boutique type carpets. So these are carpets that, um, that they know will only last for such a short time. So um, a carpet takes, uh, depends on the size and the intricacies of, its, uh, 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 of the details of the design, but it takes maybe about a year for it to be woven. Mm -hmm. And it takes about six months before that to come up with a design, the colors and the scheme. And so by the time the, the carpet hits the market, they know that now they have to work on a new design. So the, the, the very best carpet producers are at, at the forefront of making sure they are um, coming up with new designs, which is very difficult and very arduous. And within Iran, they're, they're copying their carpets, but they're also copying their carpets in India, in Pakistan, in Egypt, in Morocco. Turkey, in, in Morocco, in China. Mm -hmm. And um, it used to be sometimes machine-made, but now they are making handmade Persian carpets in China. So it is incredibly difficult to be able to tell, except if you have the expertise. And that's the other element in my book that comes out, is the way that um, these, these carpet merchants become experts in terms of knowing wh what these rugs are. And so if you go into a carpet store, um, anywhere you see carpets that are called Persian design. Mm -hmm. Those often mean that they were probably not made in Iran. And, um, and so, Again, the designs are copied from uh, probably modern or classic Persian carpet designs, but the fact that they weren't made in Iran, does that make it less or more of a value 
to the consumer, it's less of a value mm -hmm. for sure because they expect it to be made in Iran. I see. Thank you so much for being here today and sharing some of your work. Thank Absolutely you so much fascinating. For Thank, Thank you. you. For more information about Professor Arami and her research, please visit our website at yale.edu backslash Macmillan Report. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale. Mm -hmm.